Hey everyone, good afternoon, good morning, depending on where you are joining us from. We are so thrilled that you have chosen to join us. This is a really, really fun event. Uh, you know, I always have fun with you whenever you show up in these office hours or any of the events we've done, but today is a really special one. We're kicking off a, a new series of conversations with incredible cooks, people who have so much wisdom and just experience to share with us. And uh, well, I couldn't be more proud and pleased that uh, my dear friend Domenica Marchetti chose to join us for this. You know, here in these COVID times when we were sitting in our houses, uh, uh, at, well, after a while, you just kind of start looking around at the things around you. And well, one of the things I just did, I just started pulling books off the shelves, books that I hadn't revisited in a couple of years. And uh, that was kind of the inspiration for this was uh, well, just connecting with people that uh, have it really important works out there in the world, such as Domenica's book, The Glorious Vegetables of Italy, uh, back from 2013, I believe. But uh, this was uh, a book that really gave me a whole lot of inspiration, and I go back to constantly uh, just to, you know, I live up here in Maine, and uh, just to be reminded of what delicious seasons look like. But uh, anyway, for those of you who have joined me before, uh, you know, well, you know what? I'm sorry. I, we just kind of dove right into this. Hi, I'm Barton Siever. It's really a, pl it's a pleasure to meet you. Thanks for joining us today. And to old friends, welcome back. So I am joining you today from the ragged, jagged, delicious coast of Maine, where I, my lovely ladyfish wife and two sons live on a saltwater farm right on the water here. Stones throw from a lobster harbor. Scallops are coming in right now. Life is tasty. Uh, but you also know that I like to uh, talk about something that I am grateful for. And, uh, well, we had uh, some technological difficulties on the way into this uh, event today. So I'm going to say that I am grateful for technology because it enables this to happen at all. And I'm also grateful for my colleague, Patrick, who is behind the scenes at Ruby, making sure that these things happen at all. So thank you all for that. So the event today, if you look at the browser video, the window you've got there, uh, you see on the bottom right hand side, uh, you've got a, a number of questions. If there's a question that's particularly relevant to you, heart it and it will help to bump it up to make sure that we get to see it. Uh, and we'll try and get to all of the questions today. But we have a lot of ground to cover. Why? Well, because we're talking about the glorious vegetables of Italy, and well, what's more glorious than the vegetables of Italy? And this is awesome. So with that, please welcome Domenica, who is joining us from her home in uh, Arlington, Virginia. Yes, is that? Alexandria. Alexandria, Virginia. So close, back, close. back my old stomping ground. So Domenica is an incredible name, uh, well-renowned in the uh, culinary community for her books, uh, seven books, uh, and as well as a, a very long and storied career as a journalist writing for just about every food publication you can think of. She's now a educator, a tour guide, taking people to her beloved uh, Italy. And with that, Domenica, you're awesome. Thanks for joining Oh, thank you so much. Wow, what a pleasure it is to see you and to be doing this with you. And I am honored to be uh, kicking off this uh, series with you, Barton. What a fun series. Um, and, I, and I can't wait to see who else you're going to be talking with in who the knows? coming weeks. Well, I, I mean, really, no one is going to be able to meet you know, your standards. So I think we're just going to call it off after this one, really. Oh, well, obviously. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> You just killed the whole concept with, with your brilliance. Um, so ostensibly, the, the, the topic of conversation here is, is your book, The Vegetables of Italy, but you are an, an expert in well, all things Italian cuisine. Uh, would you tell us a little bit about sort of how you came to be with us today? Yes. Um, well, yes. Uh, you mentioned my pre uh, previous career as um, as a journalist. I used to be a newspaper reporter, but I grew up in an Italian family, and um, so that means that we didn't talk politics at the table. We talked about food. We talked about what we were going to be eating tomorrow and where we were going to go. And um, so I spent a lot of time. Um, 
thinking about food, cooking food with my mom when I was little, and she was a wonderful home cook. Um, I spent my summers in Italy when I was growing up. My mom was born and raised there, so um, we had a, a place in Rome where uh, she had three sisters who shared an apartment in Rome for many years, and in summers we would go there, and then we would go out to the beach on the Adriatic coast of Abruzzo. So. Um, my family is from, I guess, Abruzzo, you could say, is mid-calf on the boot of Italy. So if you travel east from Rome, you end up in the um, Apennine Mountains, and that's kind of where the border of Abruzzo is and extends out to the Adriatic coast. So it's a really wonderful part of Italy, not very tourist-traveled except for the beaches in summer, but really good um, food, very hearty food from the mountains coastal cuisine, lots of, um, you know, rolling hills as you get out towards the coast where olive groves, you know, olive oil, um, vineyards, and of course, lots of lovely land to um, grow plenty of vegetables. So um, I got into food writing when my kids were little. I left my journalism job and sort of reinvented myself as a food writer. And that led to you know, newspaper gigs and um, eventually books. So um, I really couldn't do anything but write about Italian food. So that's what I've been doing these last number of years. And yes, I've written seven. Um, and The Glorious Vegetables of Italy was my Oh my gosh, um, one, two, th third or fourth. And it came after I had written The Glorious Pasta of Italy. Um, and I think maybe just testing all those pasta recipes, I just decided I needed to pivot and um, remind people that Italians eat more than pasta and pizza and cheese and gelato, that they actually eat a lot of vegetables and they have great ways of cooking them. So that's how I um, came up with the idea for that book that we're focusing on today. Awesome. Well, thank you for that little tour and that little transportation. Uh, you know, it's, it's 17 <laughs> degrees here in Maine with the, a lot of snow on the ground. Yeah. Even the chickens are complaining. So, uh, yeah, that was a lot uh, of armchair travel, right? These days, we're all doing a lot of armchair travel. Well, yeah, <laughs> but you know, one of the things that I've been doing is is traveling through your your book, and you've got these just incredible spreads. Uh, Sang Lake yes. Sang An. Uh, saying on yes he's a wonderful photographer and he did the photos for that for the book and um, just the portraits of the vegetables are really fabulous they just have their you know they all have personalities and, and characters and um, so uh, I thought he did a wonderful job of, okay. of showcasing them well I've been having a lot of fun because I have a four and a half year old boy as you know Alden and uh, so I'll, I'll just point to something and be like Barba Biatole I don't know if that's the correct uh, <laughs> you know, accents on things, and he will just look at me like, uh, that what are you talking about? The fungi, you know? And just, anyway. I that's right. That's that. correct. Yes. But um, yeah. So one of, one of the things that, that really struck me is in, in your introduction, the second paragraph you started off with, in many ways, Italian cooking is really a celebration of vegetables. Um, and then you, you just... You just go on to sort of open Pandora's. What delicious. did I say? It's been so. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I well that like I said, I sort of feel like um, people forget that that um, you know Italians really do. It is a very vegetable centric cuisine, um, although people don't really think of it that way. But. Um, you know, if you get out to, uh, to the rolling hills, not only of Abruzzo, but um, up in the P Piedmont region in the Veneto, that's where all the chicories are grown. So all the various forms of radicchio, chioggia, uh, Verona, Castelfranco, which is a very pretty speckled, green and pink mm -hmm. speckled um, radicchio, all sorts of winter squashes and pumpkins and vegetables that, you know, people might not necessarily equate with Italian cooking, but um, the beauty of, of Italy is it is, um, you know, a Mediterranean climate, but it's also an Alpine climate, and it's many microclimates too, so so many vegetables grow well, you know, from top to bottom, and the islands of Sicily and Sardinia, so you have a wide variety of vegetables and, um, you know, lots of things you can do with them. Yeah. Well, one of the things that I wanted to, to 
talk about. I mean, the, the book is incredible, and one of the things I really like about it is you offer these little uh, biographies or culinary snapshots of the vegetables. And one of them, uh, one of my very favorite vegetables is something that doesn't translate to most Americans, and that's the cardoon. Uh, and Patrick, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you can bring up the picture of the cardoon that I sent you, um, but um, I, I grow cardoons here on the farm. Um, and do you really? Yeah, yeah, and they, they get pretty monstrous because we have a lot of chicken fertilizer, and um, yes, they're <laughs> they're absolutely wonderful. But um, so yeah, what, what the thing I wanted to chat, chat about is sort of how Italian vegetable dishes how they're constructed. Uh, you know, there's there's a lot of like multiple sort of tiers to think. You know, in America, we steam our corn and put butter on it, and it's good, it's tasty, it's wonderful, and it's delicious. But uh, I'm making a couple of the dishes from the book today, and I, I picked them out because they are. There you go, the Ardoon picture. That is awesome! Wow. Right. What a beautiful <laughs> vegetable, huh? Yeah. Yeah, it's it's also terrifying, and it hurts. But, um, it is. I, I think I said it was either artichokes or cardoons that they look. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, they look like they come. They're inhospitable. They look like they come from an alien planet. And um, and what do you do with them? You have this giant thistly stalk. Who would even imagine cooking with it? Right. Well, yeah, it's like the, the it was a brave person who first ate an oyster is the, the, the statement you might have heard. It's like it was a really brave and hungry person that first did a cartoon. <laughs> yeah. So uh, one of the things that I, I was just saying, sort of the construction of dishes, and this is one of the, why I thought you, you would be such a great uh, guest host with us today, because a lot of the Ruby family uh, is focused on whole foods, plant-based diets. Uh, we have a lot of uh, professional development course uh, folks as well joining us today. So you know, Italian food is, it's just sexy as a, as a category. Um, you know, it's, well, it gets us excited for things, but what's so amazing about it to me is that it's, it presents itself with such simplicity, but really the recipes that you have in here are so layered in such intelligent ways. Um, and I mean, first and foremost, the, the thing I'm making, I'm, I'm making your vegetable broth. Uh, and, oh yeah, good. And it's yeah. awesome. So this started off with I had uh, leeks, carrots, onion, uh, fennel, which is my very favorite ingredient of all mm -hmm. time of anything. Yeah. Uh, and thyme, parsley, and then olive oil, and then you, you put them in the oven and you, you brown them. And I I also have a six month old child, and so I burnt them because we have <laughs> we have no focus here in this house. Um, but then you simmer it just for, for about half an hour and the flavor that has come out of it is so uh, surprisingly deep that the roastedness uh, blends it all together and then you finish it with wine. Can you tell me about that interaction yes. and just sort of how it plays a role so, in the dishes work? Yeah, so I think I was trying to create um, something that I had had when I was young. I just remember, and I don't know if this is, uh, the memory is so old uh, that I don't even remember exactly where I had this, whether this was something I had at home or at someone's house, but I just remember um, having a wonderful, really simple soup in vegetable broth, real pastina, so a little pasta, um, a little tubettini, so those little um, tube pasta cooked in um, vegetable broth and, um, and I really loved it so much that I wanted to kind of try to recreate that flavor. Um, so, uh, so this is not actually an old family recipe. My mother used to make chicken broth and meat broth, um, but the vegetable broth was something that I um, actually came up with. And soup is my very favorite food in the entire world, I think. I My first book was um, all about Italian soups and stews, and so I think um, little pastina and broth was probably the first solid food I ever ate. It'll probably be <laughs> the last solid food I ever eat when I have no more teeth left in my head. But um, so I, I wanted to create this wonderful vegetable pastina soup that I had had. And I have made vegetable broth before where you just simmer all the vegetables in a 
pot like you would a chicken broth or something and it, it it's good but then I thought okay um, if you um, if you are a meat eater and you roast bones and make your broth with that that adds a deeper layer of flavor so I um, decided to sort of apply that method to the vegetables and um, I was really happy with the way it turned out but um, I often add wine to sauces um, you know sautés or whatever just to give an extra layer of flavor so when I was finishing this um, broth I, I just kind of decided to add a splash of wine to it and um, it really just seemed to be the one thing that you know, the acidity or it, you know it added just another little bit of depth to um, the vegetable broth and when you are a flexitarian like I am so I do eat meat and dairy um, you know, you're really trying not to mimic the flavor of um, you know a meat broth or chicken broth or whatever but you want to get that depth and um, so I think between the roasting of the vegetables and the wine um, I managed to get the depth in, into that broth and it you know, it did remind me very much of um, of that bowl of soup that I had when I was younger that I was trying to recreate. Well, that's awesome. Well, it w one of the suggestions you made is, is dry white wine or sherry. Uh, and I use mm -hmm. a, an Amontillado, uh, which is not a technically a dry sherry, but it, it's close. And, um, you know, I've never, act I've never added uh, alcohol at the end of a process like this so that's something that I saw that was that was really innovative to me and, and interesting and so I just added that in as per the instructions and I'm gonna wait the 15 minutes oh. of simmering <laughs> we'll it again see, yes. and uh, so I'm, I'm looking forward to that but, uh, so the other thing uh, well the other aspect of that that I wanted to talk about was uh, use Parmesan rinds uh, you call for that can, yes. you, can you tell us a little bit about this little gem I have a whole freezer full of Parmesan rinds, or a whole big container in my freezer, because we go through Parmesan pretty fast, quickly in, in this house. Um, but um, so there was a time when you couldn't buy pieces of Parmesan that didn't have the rind on them. Now they, some places actually sell the rind separately. But that rind really adds um, umami, you know, that savoriness to um, whatever you're making. So I I just toss Parmesan rinds into a lot of, um, of uh, things that I make, a lot of basic fundamental recipes that I make. And, you know, this broth is one of them. Um, my mother actually years ago made a, an entire broth out of Parmesan rinds and water. And it was really quite amazing. I haven't replicated that, but um, but I do like to pop, you know, just toss a Parmesan rind into not only broth, but um, I make a lot of vegetable soups, um, you know, with beans or chickpeas, uh, carrots, onions, celery, potatoes, um, sometimes some chopped greens, um, and so I almost always toss a Parmesan rind into that. Sometimes I Put a little piece of rind into a tomato sauce if I want to deepen the flavor. Um, so yeah, th don't ever throw out your parm rind because it it really does add a lot to um, to your food. And if you are the cook, here's a little secret: um, by the time your soup is done cooking, the Parmesan rind is very soft and gooey, and um, so you can serve your family your delicious soup, but you save that little piece of parm rind for yourself, and, and it's um, it's a nice little treat. There you go. You get the first sip of wine out of the bottle yeah. and the Parmesan rind at the end. Yes. Nice. <laughs> um, so proof of the cook. So one of the things that I. Well, it occurred to me, so I had a, uh, it, the, the stock called for parsley, and uh, I had a bunch of cilantro in the fridge that unfortunately froze at the bottom of the fridge. Um, so I threw that in there, and it got me thinking, does cilantro have a place in Italian cuisine? I've never you know, really seen uh, it. I don't think so. In fact, when I first tasted cilantro, the first time I ever tasted cilantro, I was in my 20s and I was living um, in Detroit working at a newspaper and there was a Thai restaurant out in the Burbs um, that I used to go to and that's when I first tasted cilantro and I did not like it at first and I used to pull it out of everything that 
I, you know, I liked Thai food, but I didn't like the cilantro. Um, well, now, of course, I love it because my palate's gotten used to it. But um, it, it is a flavor that you have to adjust to, and you don't typically see it in Italian cooking. I think sometimes you see coriander seed in Italian cooking, but not even very often. So, um, yeah, I, I'll be curious to... to uh, hear how how the broth turns out. I think it'll be fine because this is kind of like a basic broth, and it's meant to, um, you know, I have a couple of variations in the book. There's one, one is tomato vegetable, so I actually love a vegetable broth that has a little bit of tomato in it. So adding either a dollop of tomato puree or even some chopped tomato um, adds um, a little bit of umami, and then mushroom broth is another variation that you can um, do with this. So why not cilantro, right? You can change the flavors. Um, um, as you know, according to whatever you want to, you know, whatever you're making. So, yeah. Well, that, that is also one of the great, uh, as far as I understand it, the hallmarks of Italian cuisine. It, it is uh, a cuisine born of the moment, uh, of the season, of abundance. Uh, sometimes referred to as, as peasant cuisine, but it's more like uh, just awesomeness cuisine. And uh, you know, that, that connectivity to the land. Uh, so do you feel like the cooks here watching, uh, you know, who are, who are interested in Italian cuisine as a uh, sort of a concept, is it is is it a cuisine that allows for a lot of interpretation and um, you know, fusion, if you will? That's that is such a good question, and this is something um, I think about a lot because um, when you think about Italian cuisine, you think about, you know, Italian cooks are really purists. You know, if if you try to um, veer even a little bit from, you know, a, a traditional carbonara recipe or cacio e pepe recipe, which is just, you know, cheese and pepper and pasta and lots of cheese and lots of pepper and then with carbonara just a little bit of the um, um, I think a little bit of onion and the guanciale or pancetta um, and if you dare you know um, I like to deglaze when I cook the pancetta down I like to deglaze it with just a splash of wine remember we were talking about the wine and because uh, I like that extra layer of flavor but purists would really get pissed off at, at that they you know you're not supposed to do that. Carbonara, carbonara does not call for that. But, uh, you know, the way I um, see it is there are a couple of things. One, I always try um, to, you know, start with tradition and depart from there. Um, you know, there are purists all over Italy, but also there are everybody is opinionated. Um, everybody's got the real recipe, uh, you know, and, and um and there's always a little variation. So, you know, Italian cuisine is hyper local. So it not only is it regional, it's provincial. And then, you know, something can be different from one town to the next and from one kitchen to the next. So um, there is variation in Italian cuisine. Um, the other big thing that seems to be happening is that a lot of Italian cooks um, are experimenting now with um, flavors and recipes that you would we didn't used to see once upon a time. So you might very well see cilantro in an Italian dish now where you wouldn't have maybe a couple of decades ago. And a lot of that's due to the internet and the blogosphere and, um, you know, young Italian cooks wanting to experiment. Um, you know, I see... Um, Italian cooks taking on American cuisine and um, sort of Italianizing burgers or muffins. Um, I've even seen bagels um, on Italian blogs. So, you know, I have mixed feelings about all of this, of course. But but look, um, cu cuisine, cooking doesn't happen in a vacuum. You know, I mean, we, we are, it's always evolving. And Italian cuisine is really a mishmash of many cultures. If you think just of Sicily and over the centuries how many um, you know, groups in, um, invaded Sicily and left their culinary mark on the island. Um, I mean, that's where citrus comes from, almonds, honey, all of these things came from the Middle East to Sicily and now they are just integral to um, Sicilian cuisine and 
um, and baking. And then I think in the 18th or 19th century, there was a big um, influx of Swiss bakers down to Sicily. And that's why mm. Sicily's baking is so revered. It's so all, you know, like I said, we don't, nobody cooks in a vacuum. I live in Northern Virginia. So, you know, if I can't find um, pancetta or whatever, maybe I'll use a piece of cured ham from, um, you know, some from a, a Virginia country ham. I mean, we, we all use what we we have, and I think that's what makes cooking endlessly fascinating. So, what, what do Italian purists think of American ketchup? Um, you know, I think um, I, you know it really depends because I will say that um, you know American style cuisine is really increasingly popular in Italy. Um, I remember when the first McDonald's opened in Piazza di Spagna in Rome, and then um, not long after it opened, I think it was bombed. Um, there was a bomb that was set off by an anti-global, um, mm -hmm. I don't know, and, and but anyway. Slow foods was uh, so, founded. You know, yeah. Yeah, yes, slow food was, was founded. So, but you, you know what? There are still um, fast food places um, throughout Italy. I think that um, these are two forces that are, you know, that are, are opposing, and they will always be opposing. Um, I do feel that um, this that slow food has been a wonderful thing for um, Italian culinary traditions and even the evolution of Italian culinary mm -hmm. traditions. But just um, uh, reviving lo home cooking and local recipes and local specialties and even ingredients, you know, all of the, um, the arc of taste, the, all the, the special in ingredients, like the little artichokes that are grown on, on the, um, hills near Vesuvio and the tomatoes. And, uh, you know, they're all, uh, they all have protected status now. Um, and a lot of these things were, sort of falling by the wayside. So um, I, I really didn't answer your question about ketchup, though, did I? I mean, well, yeah, no, honestly, I, mean, it, I, I, it's, I, it's picking yeah. up on everything we've talked about, spoken of in sort of tradition and evolution yeah. and, and seasonality. And uh, Right. I had one experience. I was cooking in a tiny little village called San Vincenzo de Bonvincino uh, outside of Doliani. And uh, it, it, was, it, was, it was after a slow food Terra Madre event. And... Uh, it was, just, it was such a wonderland. But one of the things that I realized on that trip was even things like polenta are seen as seasonal foods. Uh, you know, the way that yeah. the farmer there was, was telling me that they let the corn dry on the stalk in the field and they mill it throughout the winter. And when it's gone, it's gone. It's, it's not a staple so much as it's a staple of the moment. Um, yes. And that's that, so true. And go ahead. Please. No, I, I. It just reminded me of something. Um, not polenta, but um, so um, boy. Though when it's a staple, it's really a staple. We spent Christmas in Aosta a couple of years ago, and polenta morning, noon, and night. I mean, it went. And I loved it. It was, um, you know, when they serve it with um, lots of cheese, fonduta. They serve it um, or polenta concha, which is when you stir in a lot of um, fontina into uh, the polenta. But they serve it with carbonade, like a beef stew. They serve it, you know, lots of different ways. But um, but they really rely on it up there. But you're right. When when it's gone, it's gone. Um, a number of summers ago, we went down to Puglia with with our kids, and um, I hadn't been since I was young, and I was so looking forward to having orecchiette, you know, the little ear pasta with rapini, broccoli rab, mm -hmm. um, which I love. They're pungent, spicy. It's one of my favorite greens. Well, rapini wasn't in season, so the only way they were serving orecchiette in every single restaurant was just with tomato sauce, plain tomato sauce. We could not get um, orecchiette with rapini because it wasn't fall. So, um, yeah, they, they still adhere to um, to these, the seasonality of, of the vegetables. Um, so, and, and if you're there in the wrong season, you know, you're not gonna, you're not going to get your artichokes um, in June. I mean, you're going to get them in uh, now, February and, and March and April. If you know, if only we could travel. <laughs> well, you know, that's one of the the principal sort of organizations or themes in your book. But I found that uh, one thing I really liked about it is that they translate fluently 
to the uh, the, the modern American marketplace. Uh, you know, I, I was looking at this here in Maine, in deep into rutabaga season. Uh, you know, with rutabaga season coming up and mushy rutabaga season coming up after that, and uh, just looking. At I these, love rutabaga, by the way. Yeah, but you know, <laughs> breakfast, noon, yeah. Uh, right. <laughs> but looking at these, and they all seem possible. And uh, so I want to uh, move into a second recipe that I'm doing. It's the crostini with the tuna and the roasted peppers. And uh, oh, good. Yeah, because yeah, it's really good. So two reasons why I wanted to talk about this one, uh, just in terms of the construction of dishes. Well, first, I like to talk about seafood. I don't know if you know this about me. Um, I like seafood <laughs> a lot. And no, you don't say. There's two kinds of seafood in this dish. There's this, and I took your advice from the back of the the book and got these Rizzoli anchovies. Which you found them so th for the longest time they were impossible to find over here, and now I'm starting to see them. And they're they're um, marinated in a special little spicy sauce. And if you look at the ingredients, there's actually tuna in yeah. the sauce. So I don't know if it's like the the tuna juices or something, but it's almost like um, the um, what's the, the targa um, or something? I, yeah, yeah, the the, um, the colatura. Yeah, colatura. I have a bottle back there. I couldn't remember the name, but yeah. So that those are my absolute I, favorite anchovies. I, I, when I was, I'll give I'll give you your Italian. I'll, 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 yeah. Uh, um, no. So uh, when I was when we were growing up, you couldn't find them here. So my mother would just fill our suitcases with anchovies and other things. I mean, literally just dozens of tins of those anchovies, and we would. Um, and she would also wrap pieces of parmesan and um, in our clothes and so we would come back at the end of summer laden with all this all this stuff um, but it's it's a great thing that we can now find those um, it's only anchovies well I, I was really excited about that because it, it's rare uh, there's an anchovy that I haven't met um, it's, you know like I, I go places yeah. and I, I like I go to the canned fish aisle and I see what they have and I eat them and it's, people think I think I'm weird, including my wife. Yeah. Who, by the way, sends her love and says hello and that she misses uh, her. Well, right back at her, yes. So this dish, so uh, what what I really, yeah? Oh, yeah, sure. Sorry, Patrick was talking in my ear here. So uh, these are the anchovies that Domenica recommended. Um, I have not had them yet. I'm very excited to have this here. Uh, it's so good. They're it's not delicious. Day. They're not cheap, um, but um, mm -mm. yeah, they. Uh, ooh, cool. Yeah, so like a ro one of those little anchovies rolled onto a cracker uh, was my favorite appetizer when I was little. Um, they're very salty and a little bit spicy, and they just have a ton of umami. They're just so good. Yeah. Thank you for introducing <laughs> me to that. Oh, yeah. now see, I, I like ancho. I mean, I've, I've got five different kinds up here in my pantry, like within reach. And that's how often we use them. So yeah. thank you. I will now spend a mortgage payment on these. Appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> so um, to the dish. So these are roasted peppers. You call for them in, in the recipe to be grilled outside, adding that wonderful smokiness. Uh, any of you who joined mm -hmm. me on these uh, webinars in the past know that I love me my toaster oven. Uh, it's also because it's 17 degrees outside and roasting peppers outside. From the right now. So I'm missing the smokiness here, but what you do and what you build into this are these counterpoints of salty, sweet, acidic. Can you talk about the construction of this and, sort of, and, and yes, how that relates uh, to Italian vegetable cuisine. If you yeah. Will. So peppers are uh, probably one of my favorite vegetables. Um, I mean, just the smell of roasted peppers or grilled peppers or peppers frying on the stove to me is the smell of, of Italy. And I, I, if you think of, um, you know, for those of you who have been to Italy before, um, if you think about um, walking down a side street at lunchtime and hearing the clatter of plates and you can probably just smell roasted peppers. Um, if you go into a trattoria, they have, you know, and, and um, 
this used to really be the case back in the 70s and 80s, where they'd have these tables with all sorts of prepared foods, like fried um, zucchini and the roasted peppers and eggplant um, and olive oil and all these wonderful dishes that you can have as, as an antipasto. And so um, I, I, you know, that's kind of where I started with this recipe with that pepper flavor. But of course, you know, peppers are sweet. So um, the anchovy adds a little bit of saltiness to them. Um, parsley is color, capers for the brine, the brininess, and, um, and of course, a little bit of vinegar for that acidity. I love the Italian agrodolce, those flavors. So agrodolce means um, sweet and sour. And um, so this is just kind of a, a version of sweet and sour peppers. Um, but, you know, you can do it with eggplant. You can do it with zucchini. Um, it's just vegetables really um, do well with all of the, they soak up the, the you know, the vinegar, the, the brininess. And, um, and all together, you know, the, the sum is, the uh, whole is always more than the, some of the parts. I don't think I said that right, but you get my, <laughs> you yes. get my drift. Yes. And it all works together. So yeah. And you know, this is one of those things too, if you let it sit for a little while, it gets even better because that all of the flavors marry and um, my mouth's watering just thinking about it. <laughs> yeah, well, you, you are welcome to come. I don't have any peppers. Yeah. Any post COVID time. So um, I, I, what was really so interesting to me is, is that layering. Uh, you know, and when we're talking about uh, veg forward cuisine, when we're talking about whole foods plant based, uh, and certainly in the construction of good menu items, just in the classic sort of American kitchen, uh, it, it really is that balancing act that, in my opinion, makes for great cooking. Uh, anybody can buy good ingredients, cook them properly, and put them on a plate. That's right. that's fine. It's great. It's called a steakhouse right. concept, or it's you're buying the ingredients and the experience. Uh, but this dish and the one after it, which is the roasted fennel uh, side dish, oh. um, you know that layering of flavors. So you have salty, you have sweet, and you have these little. Um, I mean, it kind of feels like a little arcade, like sort of blowing up in your mouth, but. Uh, one of the things that I, I find so compelling about it is that it works at room temperature, which you just mentioned, sort of those giant long tables at the contorni. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's one of the things that I associate with Italian vegetables is it's not sort of the American way of steam it, you know, meat plus two, uh, but rather right. it's sort of these long cooked or slow simmered or really uh, sort of purposefully prepared dishes constructed in their own right, uh, and then they're just kind of left on the table, and they just get better and better. They, they do. They get better and better, and you're right about that. So I think it, you know, it, at least um, traditionally, we, we've had, sort of had two ways to cook vegetables here in the U.S., and I think you know, we've come a long way. Um, I, I really feel that way, but it's either... They've got to be barely steamed and very crunchy, you know, like your green beans, you have, they have to snap, they just have to be bright green, or, you know, you boil them to death and you take every appealing thing out, out of the vegetable. But um, I think we're learning how to, to roast uh, vegetables now and, and coax that flavor out of them. Um, one thing Italians aren't afraid of, though, is cooking their vegetables past that crunchiness. So one of my favorite ways, for example, to make green beans is to simmer them in tomato sauce, a little bit of hot pepper and garlic. And, you know, they I especially like with those flat Romano beans. Um, and, you know, I'm talking about simmering them for 30, 40 uh, minutes until they're way past green and they're tender and meaty and they've absorbed all of that tomato flavor. Um, so yeah, we do, we, Italians do tend to eat their vegetables, um, cooked beyond, uh, their pasta is al dente, their vegetables are tender, you know, so it's, it's, um, maybe kind of the opposite of the way that people in this country, um, you know, grew up learning. So, uh, yeah, don't ever be afraid to 
to cook your vegetables because they, you know, it doesn't matter if they're crunchy, they pick up all sorts of other flavors, flavors, their texture changes. I mean, not only, you know, broccoli or green beans or, or whatever, but I'm thinking of things like um, chicories as well. I recently um, made a, a recipe from an Alpine cookbook, which was for um, Cane Italy, which is the Italian version of canoodle or canoodle, but which is a dumpling, a bread dumpling, but it had sauteed radicchio in it. And if you cook radicchio, you're basically creating another vegetable. It loses Completely a lot of its bitterness. Different. It gets yeah. pulpy. It, it, it takes on a little bit of sweetness. And so, um, you know, vegetables have different personalities de depending on how uh, you treat them in the kitchen. So uh, for the, the Ruby family here, you know, one of the, the takeaway there that I uh, would really love to drive home is that uh, a vegetable should not be seen as, you know, just the accompaniment, but also really think about the ability to uh, not get extravagant, but to really, as I was saying, sort of purposefully prepare these vegetable dishes, leave them be, let them stew for a long period of time, let them get all happier in the fridge, and serve them so that yeah. you, you have these truly compelling dishes in their own right that become so easy to serve. Uh, you know, and I'm thinking like, hey, uh, Thanksgiving, uh, hey, big parties. You know what's really easy to serve? Yes. Things you made yesterday, right? Good. Things you made yesterday and can sit out at room temperature. Absolutely. And then, you know, if you want to fresh them up, freshen them up, you just add a drizzle of really good olive oil and that just makes it all bright. And, you know, you've got, if you're doing roasted or grilled peppers, you've got that silky pepper and you've got the marinated juices. And, um, and, you know, by the way, you can do this with or without tuna. Um, you know, I, I know you love seafood. I love seafood as well. And I especially love tin seafood. I mean, I just, um, you know, all of that stuff. Um, but you know, how pretty is that? Yeah. Right. Colorful. So gorgeous. Yep. Served over Christini. So that's the, uh, and that you make that pepper base. Uh, you put whatever else you want in it. I mean, I, I would think uh, even you know, balsamic marinated uh, sauteed shiitake mushroom slices would be a really good oh yeah uh, you know swap for the for the tuna in that. Um, but uh, yeah, those layered flavors. So I was making that while she was talking. So we've got the peppers in there. They're roasted, peeled, seeded, and then cut into strips. The chopped capers. Uh, it was cilantro, not parsley. Sorry, Domenico. I bet it's going to be pretty Right. Good. Oh, right, right. I'll bet it will. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but you know, if you have leftovers, and if you have leftovers, you know what you can do? You cook pasta, and you can toss that with pasta and turn it into a really fresh pasta sauce. Luckily, my kid will just put his face in that um, and, <laughs> and, and then put his good. and roll his face all over the couch, of course. So... Uh, well, I dish, think that's great. The last dish I, I want to just talk about, because again, it just sort of uh, speaks to the uh, that layering of flavors, and then we have a lot of questions, so I want to get to that, because uh, Domenico oh, is okay. one of the But uh, that roasted fennel dish, so picking up on yeah. what Domenico was saying about uh, completely altering the character of a vegetable, and I think about a carrot stick versus a roasted, silken, sultry, sexy, beautiful, woodsy, rustic, awesome carrot, sweet and crunchy. Oh, man, it's so good, right? So fennel yeah. is a lot like that. Uh, and in this recipe, you have uh, something I, I found really compelling, which was you rehydrated raisins uh, with yes. some wine oh, yes. and rosemary as sort of the counterpoint to the fennel. Yes, and that recipe, that recipe I had at a wonderful um, restaurant in Chicago years ago, and um, so all credit to to the chef who shared it with me, um, Age and as soon as I can find, the, oh, thank you so much, um, <laughs> John Coletta is the, is the chef, um, and he had a, I don't know if he still has it, I haven't been to Chicago in a long time, but it, his restaurant's called Cortino. Um, and I loved that recipe. Now, I, I like fennel raw. I put it in salad. It's really good with orange in winter. You know, you just make a nice um, salad of, of 
uh, shaved fennel, blood oranges or re regular oranges, good olive oil, sea salt, maybe some cured olives, and um, I'm good to go. But when you roast the fennel, like chicory, it becomes a different vegetable. It gets sweet. It has, um, it's tender and silky, but still has a little bit of texture to it. And um, of course, the um, the addition of the raisins gives it a little Sicilian touch. Um, you could probably sprinkle pine nuts on that if you want. My daughter is definitely allergic to pine nuts, so we don't keep any in the house, even though she's long gone. I'm kind of used to not having them around. Um, and uh, and then balsamic vinegar, a little a splash of wine. Yeah, so um, this is a lovely um, way to treat um, fennel, which I think a lot of people assume they're not going to like because they think of licorice and um, they assume that it's going to have an aggressive flavor. But when you cook it, um, it, it really changes into something different. Look how pretty that is. Yeah. And uh, just super thinly shaved Fresno chili or Serrano chili, whatever. But uh, yeah, you know, the roasted vegetables, think about any roasted vegetable. What I, I really loved those raisins. So simmered in white wine, orange juice, orange zest and uh, rosemary, which takes it from this purely sweet uh, into, you know, halfway into the savory realm. So it's this incredible sort of mashup. And in terms of a little yeah. technique, like at restaurants, we always have these like little secret things in our back pockets that we can use, and, like raisins like this. You can do up a, a cup of them or whatever, keep them in the fridge for, I imagine, a week or, or more. But you throw that onto a piece of roasted fish or, you know, with some chopped herbs and over a uh, grilled mush, uh, mush, marshmallow, mushroom, marshmallow. I, I have a four and a half year old, uh, you know, grilled mushrooms, yeah. anything like that. So yeah, that's one of the other things that I love about your book is that you have all these wonderful little sort of tips, these things that just are, are sort of seemingly hidden in there but uh you know you make that once and those raisins are going to stay in my pantry so thank you for that so yeah that's right um i i do like to make so i'm like i, I my little dirty secrets that i'm not a chef I'm a, I'm a cook i'm a home cook i never went to culinary school so i like to make cooking accessible and um and so yeah i try to give tips other uses for something that you might have left over and so on so I'm going to take this uh, Hungarian olive oil that I have and drizzle it all over your Italian food. I'm sorry. That's what I've got. Hungarian. So what does it taste like? Uh, it tastes like really delicious olive oil with a perfect balance. of. Uh, I, I, I don't know the, the name of the grape, but it's got a perfect balance between the buttery uh, sort of flatness uh, that you get out of yeah. you know, southern oils, but it also has just enough of the oleic acid that it uh, sort of sits up on the palate uh, nice. and sort of in the middle palate to the fore. Uh, so it's not just all aroma or it's not just all spice, but, uh, you know, on the back end, but it, it, it works really well. Mm. So, and with that, nice. let's, uh, let's dive into, um, let's dive into some questions. So Domenica, I'll read them to you. Um, okay. So, uh, someone asking, well, don't know whether the cookbook is plant based or not. Um, uh, it certainly has meat and tuna in it, uh, but her yeah. question is, uh, what vegan cheese, either purchased or homemade, would you recommend substituting in Italian cooking? That's a good one. Oh my gosh, that's such a good question, and I wish I had an answer for you, but I honestly don't know, because I, I haven't substituted, but, so, you know, Parmesan, the cheeses I use most are Parmesan, Pecorino, which is a sheep's milk cheese, and mozzarella. Um, are there vegan versions of these kinds of cheeses out there now? I don't know. Um, so I am really sorry that I, I'm falling flat on this first question, but I, I'm not familiar with vegan cheese. I'm, but now I'm curious about it. Yeah. I, uh, well, if there's anybody out there in Rubyland that would like to yeah. com comment in and, and share their expertise, uh, we both would appreciate it. So we'll move on to uh, um, uh, Laura. Hey, Chef Martin, Ms. Marchetti. What's the best way to cut and cook turnips and parsnips? Ooh, that's a good challenge for you. Mm, that That is a – well, I actually have turnips in my 
fridge. I got them at my farmer's market, um, so I've been using them. I actually love roasted turnips. If they're big enough, cut them into big coins, you know, big, thick coins. And I, and I do the same with rutabaga, by the way. And I brush them with um, a combination of either melted butter and honey or melted mm. butter and maple syrup. And then I roast them until they're tender and a little bit browned. Um, and they're a delicious side dish that way. Um, I also put them in soup. I love putting turnips um, in and probably parsnips too. I don't cook with parsnips often, I'll, I'll be honest. Um, really good in lentil soup, split pea soup, vegetable soups. Um, so I do enjoy them that way. Parsnips, I imagine, are really good roasted as carrots. Um, yeah, yeah. So those are probably my preferred ways of, um, uh, of eating turnips and um, yeah, turnips anyway. Like I said, I'm less familiar with with parsnips. Um, also raw. I mean, I kind of like yeah. the spiciness of, of raw turnip. Well, it, and raw parsnips as well. I do uh, somewhat like a, a remoulade, which is traditionally made with celery root, but I've made that with a uh, raw shredded Ooh. parsnip. Uh, you need yeah. you need the parsnips to be very fresh. Uh, parsnips dry out in the bags as they, as they age on the shelf. Uh, so a fresh parsnip, I grow them here so I can dig that. But um, yeah. Uh, the one thing I, I have, would caution, may not, maybe not against, but uh, to use uh, knowingly, is that parsnips, when incorporated into a soup, like a vegetable melange soup, uh, can, can sometimes add an overwhelming sweetness. Like I found that the parsnip can huh. actually throw something, throw a dish out of balance um, because their sweetness is, is so robust. Uh, but nothing that can't be fixed with a little bit of tomato or another little form of acid to sort of punctuate it again. All right. From well, you know what? Some I, I just before we move on from parsnips, I just want to say I um, I have a dear friend Diane Morgan who's a cookbook author. She wrote a book some years ago called Roots, and it's all about root vegetables. It's a great book. I was a beard winner, and she's got a recipe in her um, book for parsnip cake. It's like it's a spice cake with grated parsnips, and I haven't tried it yet, but I'll bet that's a really good use for them. Yeah. Wow. Cool. All right, uh, from Chris. Hi, friend. Nice to see you pop up. Welcome back. The past month, every head of fresh garlic I bought at the grocery store has turned golden brown, soft, rubber like on my countertop. What's up? Uh, I, I'll, I'll just offer an answer on that. I'll, I'll bet you it's likely garlic from last season uh, and quite, honestly, quite likely coming from China. Uh, a lot of our garlic supply does come from China. Uh, not necessarily a bad thing, but it takes a while. And when garlic gets out of cold storage and into room temperature environments, uh, when it's aged already, uh, it can very quickly deteriorate uh, and turn into that. So you're just, I think, getting good looking old garlic to begin with, uh, and then it is showing its age very quickly once you get it into that uh, room temperature environment. So. Uh, as you know, Chris, I, I grow a lot of garlic, about 1,200 heads here, and I keep it in our uh, breezeway porch, uh, which sometimes gets below freezing, uh, and it can handle that, but I keep uh, garlic in, in root cellar-like conditions. So. All right. Next up from uh, Hilda. Um, hey, friend. Nice to see you again. Uh, made your stuffed mushrooms. Dominica, that must be yours. Uh, I don't think I've ever made a stuffed mushroom. They're really good. Um and the question uh, is about removing yeah. the gills. Is that necessary? Interesting. Oh, good question. I think for um, the large portobellos, because I, I think the gills can be a little bit better if you are, you know, if you're concerned about that, they're easily removed. And if you're going to stuff them, um, why not? Because it'll give you more space for stuffing. Um, I think for the uh, little the smaller baby bellows or the cremini mushrooms or the white button mushrooms. I don't know that it, that it's necessary, and I tend not to do it. I think I only do it with larger um, mushrooms where the gills are really prominent. Yeah. The only time I ever removed gills uh, from portobellos was an aesthetic thing because the gills, you know, we were doing because this was. Back in the late 90s when vegetarian cuisine meant, do you want all the vegetables that are on other dishes on the menu with a portobello on top of it? Um, 
that was the veg plate, right? Right. That's, that's what it was. Uh, yeah. And if the gills are in the mushroom, if you grill that, uh, it, it will leach out an unattractive brown liquid, which is perfectly wonderful, tasty. Uh, but that's the only reason I would remove them. Um, but for home cooks, no, not so much. Yeah. All right. From Stacy, eggplant. Hi, Stacy. We both love eggplants. Your favorite vegetable, but it's time consuming to compare, to prepare. The ways of preparing eggplant quick and easy and not heavy handed on the olive oil. Panic, take it away. Not heavy handed on the olive oil. Well, that's a good one because <laughs> eggplant really absorbs olive oil so well and it's delicious. Um, okay, so I've got a couple of eggplant recipes in the book. One of my favorite ways to prepare it is, of course, pan frying. But what you can do is, um, you know how there are instructions to, to um, either cut up or slice your eggplant and salt it and weight it down and let it drain to remove the so-called bitter juices. Um, you don't really need to do that with young eggplant. Um, I think it works better with older eggplant that's kind of pithy. Uh, the other reason to do that is because the eggplant will, um, the cells will kind of collapse and when you go to cook it later, it will absorb a little bit less oil than, um, than if you didn't take that step. And it also absorbs some of the salt, so it, it, um, it makes the flavor better. So that's uh, one little trick I like to use with eggplant. It does take a little time. You have to let it um, kind of sit there and, and um, uh, I don't know, 30 minutes to an hour. Um, there's a wonderful recipe in the book that I really love for eggplant meatballs. So eggplant takes the place of, you know, ground meat and um, you mix it with breadcrumbs and egg and herbs and you form little meatballs and you fry them just as you would um, regular uh, meatballs. And it doesn't really absorb that much oil. Uh, and the eggplant meatballs are really delicious and then you just simmer them in tomato sauce. And um, uh, so I recommend a recipe like that. And the other way I like to do eggplant is to roast it or bake it in the oven. So if I'm making eggplant parmesan, I don't bread it and fry it anymore. I just cut the slices thin. I do the salting and letting them sit. And then I, you know, um, just kind of dry them off and I put them on baking sheet with, um, I just brush them with olive oil and bake them um, until they're tender. And then I just layer my eggplant parmesan with the roasted or, or baked eggplant. And that is a really good way to um, cook eggplant without getting too much olive oil in it. And of course you can use that um, not only for eggplant parm, but you can make those rollatini, the eggplant roll-ups where you can layer it with um, cheese and, um, you know, if you are a meat eater, a little piece of prosciutto or something and roll it up and um, and then bake the um, rolled eggplant in a little bit of tomato sauce. So that's a really good, um, uh, that's another good recipe for eggplant that doesn't take up too much, doesn't use too much olive oil. I don't know, Barton, do you have any other? Uh, I'm, re I'm really stuck on Italian um, recipes for eggplant because... Well. You know, yeah. it's like... and, and here I am trying to put cilantro in all of your work. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> um, so I would say that the quick and easy part of this uh, and, and reducing the olive oil is less in the technique of cooking than it is in the buying of the eggplant. Uh, there are a lot of different varieties of eggplant. Uh, I mean, the heirloom varieties that are just wonders in their own right. Uh, in the same way that a just a plum tomato is nothing but a Cherokee purple is something to behold. Uh, I like smaller, slender, uh, more sort of svelte eggplants than the big, bulky, giant ones that we tend to find at the sort of commonly in the store here. Those are great, especially if you're making a baba ganoush, whether you're making an eggplant hummus, uh, roasting them cut side down. But those smaller, slenderer ones tend to have skin that is a lot thinner. Uh, they also have a lot less sort of porousness in them. So. At that point, if you yeah. buy these smaller, more beautiful, sort of more delicate, and I think more highly flavored eggplants, uh, things like quick grilling them, even a brush of oil, if that at all, you can just grill it dry yes. and then serve it with a sauce where you can really control the oil, such like a salmoriglio sauce, which is uh, fresh oregano, uh, parsley, shallot, garlic, uh, and olive oil mixed together is, is a great way to go. All right. Yeah. Judith, hi friend, nice to see you again. And I loved your question. So, Domenica, 
Judith, our friend, is asking about Nepotella. She's purchased seeds to grow this summer, but could you, Chef Marchetti, discuss how it's best used in Italian cooking? And what is Nepotella? Oh my gosh, what is it? I, you know what? Um, I, I'm blanking on what it is. Is is it one of those greens? Um, like uh, it's a, it's a wild herb. Uh, it, it's basically a cross between mint oh. and oregano. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, yes. So that's um, we don't. I don't I'm trying to because I didn't grow up with that. I'm wondering if it's maybe not part of a Brutzese tradition. But um, yeah, what would you? Oh, is it really? Huh. Okay, so how, would you use it interchangeably with mint and oregano? Um, I think it would be really good with um, eggplant. You were talking about the slender eggplant. If you cross hatch and roast or grill those and you make a little gremolata, what maybe with a little mm -hmm. nepitella and some lemon zest and garlic. Um, yeah, absolutely. I'll bet it would be good um, like that. Uh, probably in tomato sauce on pizza. Um, so when yeah, I was is in, it, uh, I haven't grown it, so I, yeah, is it easy to grow? Uh, yes. Like mint? Uh, yeah, well, that's the thing. Uh, be careful. How much How much of it do you actually want? And think about that answer, what it's going to be five years from now, because it will creep. Um, it is a member of the mint family. It's more like cat mint uh, in, in the way it looks, mm -hmm. but it has this wonderful soft plushness to it and this really wonderful woodland flavor. And I associate it mostly with walking through vineyards in Italy. Uh, in the Piedmont mm. uh, and in Tuscany, where it just grows underfoot. It also grows out in Sonoma County. Uh, there is Nepotella in the vineyards uh, mm. of Iron Horse, uh, and it's just the most enchanting, romantic ridiculousness to be walking through perfection and Eden and the smell wafting up. Uh, but in Piedmont, at least, you can't, when you buy mushrooms at the market, they just hand you some Nepotella. It just comes with it, at least in as as has been told to me and experienced. Uh, mint and mushrooms are really a great combo. Mm -hmm. um, but mm -hmm. here's the thing: oregano can be a little a little heavy-handed, uh, so just go light on it. it. It's an herb that you can use raw, so you can always add more, uh, but it can also overpower. So, hey, mm -hmm. Judith, I appreciate that question. Interesting. Great one, yeah. and I, I look forward to hearing uh, back about how it goes growing it. All right, from Christina. Um, well, I think we've, we've covered a lot of that, sort of what are the popular vegetables in the north, central, and south regions of Italy. Uh, thank you for that question, Christina. From Renee, well, thanks. I appreciate your kind words. We're really thrilled that you joined us. All right, from Elena, hi to you both. Love when you're on, Barton. Aw, that's really nice. I do this for you, so it's nice to be nice to be appreciated. I'm ordering your book today, Domenica, and yours, Barton. Wow, look at that, Domenica. Both. Oh, that's so nice. Uh, Thank you. Discovered fennel over the past six months and love it. How are your favorite ways to prepare it, uh, Domenica? You touched on this. Um, uh, yeah. So the roasting, um, as you did. Um, I also, like I said, I I do enjoy it raw with. Um, you know what's really good? Um, I mentioned the um, raw, the fennel salad with um, blood oranges, um, but also very good with grapefruit. Um, and um, if you're a cheese eater, a little bit of burrata, which is very fresh mozzarella that's kind of filled with mozzarella curd and cream, um, and you just kind of um, crack that open and dollop a little bit of burrata on that um, citrus and fennel salad, um, so I enjoy it that way. I actually put fennel stalks in my chicken broth, um, and you can do it in vegetable, with vegetable broth as well, because it adds a really nice, appealing sweetness. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's, um, those are probably my favorite ways uh, with fennel, but I really do love it roasted, and if you roast a big pan of it, um, you can use it for, you know, a number of different things. Um, it's actually good tossed with pasta. So I would say if you want to keep a really, make a really simple non-tomato pasta dish, you know, um, cook some rigatoni if you've got your roasted fennel and um, maybe kind of like a, a good pecorino cheese. A pecorino Toscano is nice because it's kind of a, a fresher pecorino and it's um, nice and melty. Um, so you can toss your um, pasta with your roasted fennel and some of that cheese and a little bit of the pasta water um, and some herbs, of course. Um, 
parsley, but also I really like sage. I'm a big fan of, of sage and um, and I think it goes well with fennel. So uh, yeah, that's a couple of um, different things you can do with fennel, but I would encourage you to try it, you know, raw and cooked and to see how different the vegetable is um, depending on, you know, um, when it's raw, it's completely different. It's fresh, it's kind of bracing, it's almost like a, um, you know, palate cleanser. Um, and then when it's roasted, it's um, mellow and sweet and tender and kind of silky. So, um, yes, that, uh, yeah, that's my, there, there we go, look how pretty that is. It's such a interesting looking vegetable and with the fronds yeah. yes let's not forget the fronds oh pickled fennel i um yes i want to mention pickled fennel so when i've got a book called uh, preserving italy which is all preserving traditions um italian style preserving there we go and there's um, and it's actually on the cover it's um pickled fennel and carrots and it's a agro dolce sweet and sour and that is absolutely one of my favorite ways to enjoy fennel. Um, so you pickle it and it will last, um, you know, it, in your fridge or in the pantry and it is so good. So really good as part of an antipasto platter. I actually love pickled vegetables on pizza. Um, roasted fennel is excellent on pizza. So yeah. yes. Awesome. Well, so the fennel that you, you've seen, so it, it often comes like this. Uh, if you, when you buy it at Whole Foods, I found that they have a purchase spec where uh, you get about 10 inches of the fennel frond. And if you see a fennel growing in the wild, it is well, it's short and bulb to the ground, but then they grow about three feet high. Uh, and those giant firm-like fennel fronds just grow uh, all over the place. They can get a little woody up top, uh, but they're still very flavorful, uh, but sort of anise -y, licorice -y, the more overgrown it gets. But these tender little leaves uh, down towards the base uh, are wonderful used just as a fresh herb or picked and plucked and used uh, just as a garnish in any green salad uh, or thrown on top mm -hmm. of roasted vegetables, etc. Um, so that really adds its own sort of just a very youthful fennel flavor that it's just very harmonious. Um, but one thing that's also interesting about fennel is that you often see both male and female fennels on the market. And if you've ever seen, you know, one that looks like this, uh, and I believe that this is the female, and I, I, so I, I might be wrong on this. Uh, I, I'm sorry, this is actually the male. Um, it has that shorter, more bulbous uh, shape to it, and if you sometimes see panels that are oh, yeah. far more uh, vertical. And uh, this right. is within the same box of fennel, so it's not different species or varietals. Uh, so female fennel, the tall, narrow ones, tend to have a lot more uh, sort of spice to them. They have a lot more aroma, whereas the male ones have uh, just sort of a, a deeper, richer flavor, sort of more sweetness about. So anyway, not to get too caught up in the fennel weeds, but uh, there you go. Yeah, Something that's interesting. Yeah. So, all right, from uh, Jenny. Oh, she's offering a, a wonderful suggestion about Via Life brand uh, Parmesan-like vegan cheese. Uh, thank you very much. Appreciate that, Jenny. Great, thanks, yes. All right, from Jamie, an answer to Laura about parsnips and turnips, using both in a chicken matzo ball soup, right on. There you go, and pureed mm -hmm. parsnips are a lovely mm -hmm. alternative to mashed potatoes. Hey, great suggestion, Jamie. Thank you for sharing those. Yes. Mashed parsnips, wow. That just sounds like Valentine's Day dinner. Mm. Mm. All right, I'm attempting to adopt the Mediterranean diet from Jim. The Italian vegetables couldn't be a better fit to shape my diet. Well, hey, I really appreciate that you are making the effort towards health and deliciousness, and I appreciate that you've joined us and mm. made us a part of your day. That's, and uh, Domenica is a genius, and I hope that she has set you set you free with inspiration here. Uh, <laughs> all right, uh, from. From Kelly, question about pasta. There you go. I'm sure fresh pasta would always be best, but is there a significant difference between taste with dried pasta? Oh, this is one of my favorite questions because this is a misconception that so many people have. Fresh pasta is not better than dried pasta. They are two different things and they both have their application. So fresh pasta um, is 
you know, not always. It's often pasta made with egg. Uh, so it's a delicate pasta and you use it to make, you know, tagliatelle, the sort of flat noodles, lasagna, um, you know, spaghetti, uh, thin noodles, uh, you know, ravioli. Um, and, but you can also make semolina and water pasta. And that is actually what dry, most dried pasta is made from. The boxed pasta you see is basically finely ground semola or hard wheat uh, flour and water and no egg. Um, and it's just dried in very kind of controlled conditions um, so that it can stay boxed and um, keep fresh. And um, it does have a different texture than fresh egg pasta, um, but it, it doesn't mean that it's not as good. I think, uh, you know, if you get a really good brand of boxed pasta, it's just as good as fresh pasta. Um, so I, I actually teach uh, semolin water pasta, so you can make that type of pasta fresh as well. Um, and, you know, I, I pop it in my freezer and, uh, you know, instead of drying it out because I'm in a house, I don't have controlled conditions. Um, so I sort of keep it fresh that way. But there are some sauces that I would rather use dried pasta for. So if I'm making, you know, a special tagliatella with bolognese ragu, I want the, that, the green um, spinach noodles or the beautiful yellow egg noodles. If I'm making spaghetti alla carbonara, which requires vigorous stirring of the pasta to get that emulsification. So you're making, you've got the pancetta, the cheese, and... Um, uh, you know, there's there's not much to it other than um, pancetta and, uh, you know, it's drippings and cheese and salt and, and whatever. Um, because of that vigorous stirring, I don't want to use a delicate egg pasta for that. I want to use a sturdy, you know, hard wheat and water pasta uh, that's going to stand up to that vigorous stirring and will probably pro properly absorb that carbonara sauce. So um, don't think of it in terms of one being better than the other. Just think of them as two sort of versions of, you know, of, of pasta that each has their own characteristics and each has their, their purpose in the kitchen. Um, so I always have boxed pasta on hand. And, um, you know, my pasta book um, has a chapter called Pasta on the Run, and it's all recipes using boxed pasta and very simple sauces that come together in the time that it takes the, to boil the water to cook the pasta. So on a weeknight, it, you know, pasta can really be a lifesaver. And, um, you know, the other wonderful thing about it is, the sky is the limit, and <laughs> the sky is the limit when it comes to what you can do. I mean, there are so many um, sauce recipes. It's, you know, tomato sauce is one recipe, ragu is another, but these vegetables that we've been talking about today, so many of them are really delicious, just tossed with pasta and a little bit of Parmesan cheese, you know, a little bit of that starchy pasta water, um, and you can have a really wonderful um, meal on the table in, in under 30 minutes. So yeah. Boxed pasta really is a, a lifesaver. At least, in, you know, was when my kids were growing up. Um, I, you know, we had we had boxed pasta a lot. Yeah, I used to think that uh, you know linguine was basically just inconvenient spaghetti uh, because it took longer. <laughs> you know, it's like, but now, you know, understanding really the development of the sauces and what you were saying, and sort of the grinding and the stirring and the emulsification and all that. And, um, uh, it's it's an amazing complexity. I mean, it, it's a cuisine. It's, it's worth uh, its entire own course, which I let me recommend uh, Domenica to be the one to teach that. Um, so, uh, running through a couple other questions uh, can, from Sarah: Can anyone can do anything with carrots that froze once they saw? Same question with cauliflower from a refrigerator outdoors. Uh, you turn them into a puree soup. There you go. Uh, you know, freezing a vegetable is just going to denature or it's sort of rupture the, the cells. And so all you're going to do is basically just have certain moisture loss. Uh, so you're actually going to be able to cook them a little bit faster uh, in that way because you're going to be able to re release that moisture, sort of roast them down a little bit faster. So if you're trying to do something like a saute, it's not really going to work as well. You're not going to get that coloration because of the steam. But uh, if you're just simmering them into a soup or you know, adding them to pasta water to cook along in the last couple of minutes uh, and then just mixing it together with olive oil, etc. Uh, but certainly it is not a waste. 
and we freeze a lot of food up here in in misbehaving refrigerators. So I'm I'm well aware of frozen carrots. Um, from Bob G, can you reuse Parmesan rinds? Uh, Domenica. Hmm. After it's been simmered, probably not because it gets all gooey and, you know, like if you've got it in a vegetable soup, some of the vegetables will adhere to the Well, you also the can't rinds, use it because so, the cook ate it, um, so, right? Because <laughs> I've eaten it, yeah. <laughs> um, but, you know, if, if you ha I like I said, I, I keep a, a con big container in the freezer of Parmesan rinds, and um, and they last well in the freezer. They'll last for months, so um, as long as they're covered well. So you can use them, but you can't use them and reuse them. Better just, you know, enjoy it yourself, you know, after it's given up its flavor. All right. Okay, so just uh, rolling through the last couple of questions here, and I'll ask uh, Domenica to end out on Linda's question. So we'll answer uh, the other ones up first. Uh, Lisa gave us a wonderful answer about dehydrated mushrooms, adding umami. So thank you very much for that. Uh, Domenica, you got some wonderful praise from Renee about your Preserving Italy book, which is my favorite of all your books, if I must say so myself. Uh, we have a question about uh, why do red peppers, yellow and orange, have thick skins recently, it seems. Uh, she's never had to peel them before after cooking. I believe that the difference there might be between field-grown and greenhouse-grown, uh, depending on where they're coming from. So oftentimes we get uh, at market field-grown peppers from California and Mexico and uh, greenhouse-grown peppers from Ontario. It's just, it, it's a thing, apparently. It's, yeah, I see them all the time. Maybe it's because I live in Maine, but uh, down in D.C. as well, there's sort of a, a pepper cartel, I guess, uh, up there. Um, those two different growing methods are going to yield plants that are just in very different environments and grow skins differently. Plus, there are hundreds of varieties of red and yellow and orange peppers. Uh, so it might just be that you've sort of hit a seam of of a particular varietal that your store is, is, is getting these days rather than in the past. Um, but uh, if you cook them properly under uh, dry heat, under the broiler, or on the grill, you should be able to peel that skin right off in the roasted sense. Um, and uh, otherwise though, uh, that skin does add great structural integrity. So another tip to get around that is to slice the pepper a lot thinner in order to mitigate the negative impacts of that uh, tough skin. So there you go. Um, and I will leave it to Domenica to answer Linda's question. Can you give us a walkthrough of exact technique and ingredients for your favorite pasta dish? Oh, uh, how do I pick a favorite pasta dish? Oh my gosh. Um, <laughs> I really, oh, Okay, um, no is the answer to that because I have so many favorites. But okay, um, what I've been making recently, I had talked about semola and water pasta. So I've been making a lot of pasta by hand um, with semola, semola macinata, which is semolina flour that's been um, ground to, uh, so it's pretty fine, uh, and water and a little bit of salt. And um, uh, and I like to roll it into cavatelli. So this is something you can do with just your fingers or if you have a little gnocchi board, which I don't have nearby, um, you can just roll little pieces of pasta down the gnocchi board. You know, there's no rolling out of sheets. It's all hand done. Um, or you can buy a bag of cavatelli. But one of my favorite simple sauces that I've been making is, um, it's not vegetarian, unfortunately, but it is a, a simple sausage ragu. And it's just a matter of um, browning sausage meat and um, you could probably do mushrooms in place though I did um, mushroom ragu is another favorite of mine so for the plant-based people out there um, it, it the two can really use be be used interchangeably so you can either brown your mushrooms um, and if I'm using mushrooms I like to use a mix you know I like some shiitakes in there because they have that nice chewy sort of meatiness to them some portobellos just some basic 
you know, everyday um, button mushrooms, oyster mushrooms, whatever um, you have on hand, or a couple of links of sausage taken out of their casing and crumbled, and just into a little bit of olive oil and um, seasoned a little bit of garlic. Uh, and then when that's browned, I add tomato and a little bit of peperoncino because I'm from Abruzzo when we love our hot pepper. And then I basically just let that all simmer and um, until it's done. If you want, you can add a little bit of chopped onion as well when you add the garlic. A little bit of onion um, always adds a little more flavor and red onion is good in this sauce. It's got a little bit of, you know, it's a little bit assertive and so it stands up well. Um, and just cook that down and that's a really lovely fast um, alternative to a very long simmering ragu. Um, so I've been doing that on Sunday nights and we've been eating a lot of our simula and water pasta and um, this sausage ragu. But as I said, it really does work just as well with mushrooms and um, porcini mushrooms, uh, which are hard to find fresh and also very expensive, but are delicious dried, also expensive, but maybe not quite as much. So. Um, I, it's always nice to toss a handful of dry porcini mushrooms into sauce. So and you can do this one of two ways. You can either reconstitute the porcini in um, hot water, in boiling water, and then add the porcini to the sauce. Along with the porcini, um, you know, you filter out any uh, of the little grit. Um, and I always add that porcini water to my sauce when I'm um, using porcini because it adds depth to the flavor of the sauce. Uh, or you can actually put the dried porcini into your tomato sauce and they will absorb the liquid from your sauce. So just make sure it's not a very thick tomato sauce. You want it to be a little bit watery and the porcini mushrooms will actually help that sauce thicken up and they add enormous flavor to um, tomato sauce. I love them. They've got, you know, almost like chocolatey, this chocolatey quality, um, very woodsy and rich and so delicious. So um, since it's winter and we've kind of had a mixture, I'm looking out my window and we've had a mixture of snow and rain today. And I'm just thinking that a nice, um, you know, sausage ragu or porcini ragu would be perfect way to dress pasta. Well, there you go. Hey, Domenica, you, you're amazing. Your, your wisdom and your experience and your passion for this. Uh, we can't thank you enough for sharing that with us here at the Ruby family. I hope that all of you who joined us today, uh, have learned as much as I did. Um, and I please support Domenica, check out her books, check her out at DomenicaCooks.com. Uh, she is an incredibly dynamic person, culinarian, uh, lots of interesting stuff always up her sleeve, including trips to Italy in case anybody wants to get out of wherever they when are. When the world reopens, yeah. yeah. Uh, but hey, good friend, dear friend, it's it's really lovely to have you back into my kitchen. Thank you for sharing yours with, our, with us, and uh, we really appreciate it. It's been my pleasure and, you know, love to you and the family. Thank you for having me on. This has been such a treat, and thank you to everyone who joined us. All right. All right, everybody. We'll be back in touch with the uh, next events coming up. We're going to uh, select our next uh, author, personality person from the bookshelf to uh, call into action here. Uh, we'd love to take any suggestions from you if there's any, uh, any anybody you'd like to try for us to try and rope in. But uh, as always, send any questions you have over to email address below, Barton at Ruby. Uh, happy to answer questions for you. Check out our uh, range of courses. Have a most wonderful Valentine's Day, uh, and please remember that cooking for people is an act of love, and um, the world needs a lot more of that. So thanks for all you do for spreading love. Cheers, y'all. Bon appetit. See ya. Ciao.